Okay, uh, I'm Lars Kronstedt. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, or even good night to you, you know, all over the globe. Uh, in introducing this dialogue, our Australian host thanked the original Aboriginal people, uh, the first explorers of their continent. Now, I sit on Viking land, um, and um, the Vikings to most of Europe and West Asia are seen as um, violent spoilers of um, private property and uh, liberty. But if you were on the right side, if you were on the inside, if you were part of the Viking band, they were a deeply democratic society that uh, collectively chose chieftains, chose uh, various paths of action, uh, and all those decisions were taken collectively. But one vital part of democracy was lacking. What to do if you saw your side lost the vote? Um, in Viking times, um, what you did, if you didn't like the way the vote went, you just picked up your swords and your oars and rode away, and that was that. Um, that option is not open to us nowadays. There is no exit. Uh, the world is not big enough for some to opt out and row away. We had to share our single globe. And the most momentous decision we have to make um, is the extent to which we can make decisions stick over a longer time. How can we make essentially short-term decision machines like we humans are? How can we make these or us uh, take decisions that will stick for a longer time to address problems that are longer than a mandate period of any of the democratically elected governments? Uh, and to me, the future of decision making is how can we produce such decisions that will stick? Uh, and uh, is therefore now we leave the current situation, we look into the future of decision making in the starting in, um, in the world we are and starting in the mental equipment of human beings. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Perez Stockness. He started out as a psychologist, uh, but is now equipped with a PhD in economics. He works at the Norwegian Business School, where he's co-director of the Center for Sustainability and Energy. He's an author of uh, a number of books, on um, where, which I think can be summed up in the title of, of one of them, namely, What We Think About When We Try Not to Think About Global Warming. Uh, a brilliant title. Um, and uh, Perspen will uh, speak under the heading, Are Humans Always Short-Term Decision Makers in the Face of Long-Term Crisis, Such as Climate? Uh, so I'll leave to you, Perspen. Another seven minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Lars. Um, yes, so being both a psychologist and an economist, the question that drives me and this research is, are humans inevitably short-term? It might seem that way because um, economics have shown that um, it's easy actually to solve climate change. Did you know that uh, we just, if you just slap a proper price on greenhouse gas emissions, typically in the range of $100 per ton and up, and then preferably as a global fee and dividend, we would rather quickly um, solve it, um, but we don't. So one explanation is that humans are, as Lars mentioned, short-term individuals or brains. We can see that in our consumption, we want it now rather than later, so-called the marshmallow brain. And then we see it in the markets. Uh, we prefer present value rather than future value. And we see it in democracies that are struggling to think more than four years periods. So are we then as a species hardwired to bring the biosphere down with us? Or as being a psychologist too, I've been training reframing issues. So um, maybe we should put the question on its head and say, what are the conditions under which humans will act for the long term? And to answer that, we need to look how our brains respond to climate science and how it's communicated, typically through the news. And um, this then is a discipline called the science of science communication with an emphasis on climate. And I've summarized a lot of the psychological and, and sociological research in articles, books, and a TED talk, simplifying that to five main inner defenses. Can you show the first slide, please? And with only seven minutes, I'll simplify even further. So research shows that when people hear climate news, 
and you try to change their their core, their heart, their their emotions, their behavior. There are five inner defenses between our ears. First is that we feel that climate is distant from me. The second that it's doom filled and so guilt and fear inducing. The third is that it's dissonance, meaning between what I do and what I know, there is a, a mismatch and that is felt as uncomfortable. Uh, so I prefer to justify my behavior rather than to change it. Uh, the fourth is that if we've had distance, doom and dissonance for a while, this, these responses get automated. Our brain is very good at automating things. And then we forget that we know what we do know. And that's the, the proper definition of denial. Um, there's been a lot of accusations of denial going around in the climate discussions. You're a denier, people pointing fingers to each other. Um, but denial is something else. It is a kind of uh, unspoken, implicit agreement between us, social settings, and also in myself, that we don't speak too much about these things. So uh, there's a kind of layer of silence under which um, we live as if we do not know what we do know. Finally, there is the identity. And I try to find, you know, simple words on D for all of them. I had to cheat a little bit with the fifth one there. So um, that it goes to the issue of um, my values, my worldview, and also my professional identity. So if I work, uh, let's say, in industry or the petroleum or transport or aerospace or uh, aviation, and then some climate activists come and, and you know scream at me and say uh, we should stop this and they call for more regulation more taxes more um, uh, breaks on individual liberty and if my values then are uh, aligned with free market values or um, uh, individual liberty then I'll feel that they are calling for big government which I don't like so I will listen to other experts that are more like better that align with my values my identity and hence uh, through the famous um, um, uh, oh, and the, the bias of um, confirmation bias, I will single out the facts that I do like. Now, how can we solve this then? Um, so please, next slide. What we do know works is that um, the human brain is more social than um, rational in the sense that I, I always care about what my neighbor, my friends, my colleagues are doing. So if they do something, if they get solar panels on the roof, then I will want it too. Uh, second, um, to diminish the denial, sorry, the, the, the doom, we need to change our framings so that they align better with a positivity ratio of three opportunities to each threat. Now, the news has that other way around. It's much more threats than, than um, uh, opportunity and possibilities. So we need to shift how we speak about climate to one threat and then three um, enticing opportunities and possibilities where we can change businesses, so cities, and, and, and um, uh, our individual lives to something better, not, not something that is removed or you lose something once you take climate into your heart. Third is that, um, oh yeah, second slide, please. Yeah. So um, in order to change dissonance, we need to make climate behaviors more simple. And this is where we can bring in nudging and behavioral economics. So any time I enter a shop, I would find that or prefer to, to do some refurbishing of my house or travel, the climate-friendly option should be the easiest, the default one. So if I don't pay attention, I come out with the best option. Fourth is that um, we can change denial with uh, frequent signals. So when you do something, you get a positive response that is uh, not just on the gloomy global science news, but on how people are responding. And finally, we need to change the story. How do we create a society that is much better with more individual liberty and freedom and better lives and lower footprints and the feasibility of that. So in conclusion then, are humans inevitably short term? Uh, in a way, yes. Um, but that is assuming that you give only people rational facts and science. So rational facts are insufficient 
to create lasting engagement. Second, humans will act for the long term when conducive conditions are in place. And then we need social norms, supportive frames, simple actions, signals and stories that go with the brain, brain friendly. And third, individual actions do not solve climate problem, but they do build the necessary support for structural change, both in business and in government. So that was my seven minute version of 500 scientific articles. <laughs> Thank you, Thurston. Uh, a very succinct summary. Um, and uh, we move on to the second of our thought leaders, Dr. Ian Watt. Um, and